you very much. And for those that don't know the translation, there's the translation in Hebrew. For those that prefer it, there's the translation in Greek. And there's the translation in English. Okay. So, yes, this is fear not so much a talk as a talk slash demonstration. So I'm going to be jumping backwards and forwards between presenting slides and giving some demonstrations here and setting you up for demonstrations that you can play with on the play table over there. At the moment it says do not touch. I'll change that in, ju in, in due course. But I'm going to show you a few demonstrations and introduce you to others and then at the TV, I invite you to come and have a play and ask any questions. So, Fiat Lux, yes, uh, let there be light. Um, although, in principle, it's actually, excuse me, there seems to be a glitch. Okay, although the uh, understanding of Fiat Lux being Latin for let there be light, it's there in the crest of the University of Liverpool. So a lot of students assumed that if it's there in the crest, that presumably means that uh, the, uh, the Fiat Lux is presumably the corporate sponsors of the university. <laughs> uh, in one way, you can think of it is, yeah, wh why, why have we got Fiat and Lux uh, actually demonstrating the corporate sponsorship? But no, uh, for those not classically trained, it does actually mean uh, let there be light. So I'm going to be talking about the nature of light, and this seems to be a bit sluggish at the moment. Is this just, it might be just the USB connections are a little bit on the side. I'm going to be talking about the nature of light, colors of light, and atoms of light. This symbol means I'll be prattling on and giving you some of the theory by giving you various PowerPoint slides. But the important part of this evening is it's going to be punctuated with a few demonstrations that fall into three categories. Measuring the speed of light, measuring the wavelength of light, uh, measuring the colors of light, and measuring the polarization of light. And these symbols on, uh, in red here will pop up from time to time. Uh, they will be in the talk to remind us that we're looking at a demonstration. Uh, and those sim same symbols are used in the handout to, again, indicate whether I'm talking to a PowerPoint presentation or talking to uh, a demonstration. So those are the symbols I'm going to be using. So we can start with what is light to start with. And uh, as a homage to Sheldon Cooper in the, uh, the Big Bang Theory, we can start with it's a warm summer evening in ancient Greece when people started thinking about the nature of light. And uh, so a few hundred years BC, uh, Empedocles here basically said, well, everything is made of earth, air, fire, and water, so your eyes are the same. And basically that means your eyes are made of earth, air, fire, and water and emit light, and that's how sight works. Now, anybody who thinks that the idea of light coming out of the eyes sounds pretty weird, just bear in mind, whoops, again, it seems to be flicking forward too much. Um, anybody who thinks it's odd to have light coming out of your eyes, well, just think about what it looks like when you're looking into the eyes of a, of a big cat like that, for instance. So we now know, of course, that external to the eye and light coming into the eye produces a chemical reaction which we interpret as, uh, as vision. But that doesn't matter what light actually is. It's simply something external to the eye, external to the body. Now, we can go back to the 1660s, where Isaac Newton was inspired by the uh, front cover of the Pink Floyd album to think about actually making light up into, into its spectral colors. And uh, he showed that white light is made of many colors. And at the time, there was a great argument as to whether light is corpuscular. Is it made up of particles, or is it made up of waves? Well, it was only centuries later that we actually got around to actually answering that question. And the answer is both. That's why it's so confusing, because sometimes it behaves like particles and sometimes it behaves like waves. But in this particular talk this evening, we're going to be looking at the wave nature of light and seeing how that helps us understand what light is. So when light passes through uh, an aperture, which could be, for instance, the aperture of your telescope or your camera lens, or it could be a narrow slit, then light will reveal its wave-like nature. And the only definition that we really need to take away is this idea of a wavelength. If you think of an infinitely repeating wave, not just the three little blobs that we have here, then the distance from one crest to the next, or if you prefer, from one trough to the next trough, that is what we call the wavelength. And the wavelengths of visible light uh, run approximately 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers from the blue or the violet end of the spectrum to the red end of the spectrum. And a nanometer is one billionth of a millimeter. 
I'll be measuring those later to actually show you that that doesn't get pulled completely out of thin air, but we can actually measure the wavelengths of light. And just to remind you that although this is called theory about let there be light, we know that visible light is only a small part of the whole electromagnetic spectrum, ranging from way over there in the gamma rays down to the radio waves. But the principles I'm talking to you about this evening apply to any light. In principle, any light of any wavelength obeys the rules that we're looking at this evening. So the demonstrations, most of the demonstrations I'm showing you involve visible light just so that you can see them literally. One demonstration will actually move to a longer wavelength for, for the demonstration that I'll show first. So a key concept which we'll need to understand most of the rest of this evening is the idea that light is a wave, and when waves interact, they can interfere with each other, as indicated by this little animation. So we've got two waves. It doesn't matter if they're light waves or water waves, anything. You can think of it as ripples on a pond, if you prefer. One of the waves happens to be static, and the other one is moving, so that you can see at certain times the waves are lined up with each other, or in phase. In other words, the crest of one wave lines up with the crest of the other wave, or indeed the trough line up. And at different times, the crest of one wave lines up with the trough of the other wave. And what we're observing here is that when they line up, when the crests line up, we get interference, as it's called. In other words, they reinforce each other, and we get even bigger ones. Whereas if the crest of one lines up with the troughs of another, they cancel each other out. And that phenomena of either reinforcing or destroying each other, or cancelling each other out, is what we call interference. And you've probably seen that before. For instance, interference effects such as the colors that you see in soap bubbles or in oil spills, very thin wall of soap bubble or very thin film of oil on the ground are not that much greater than the wavelength of light. And so certain wavelengths might reinforce each other and certain wavelengths might destroy each other. And hence you get these colored effects. So you have seen light interference before. But for the first demonstration, the key concept is this, that if we have two waves, one traveling from left to right and the other traveling from right to left, as indicated by the top two in this animation, what we can generate is a so-called standing wave. Standing wave, that doesn't mean it's static. It doesn't mean nothing is changing. It means that the result is not moving to the left and is not moving to the right. So you can see it is changing, and we've got two uh, black dots there, which we're interested in. And if we observe what's going on, we get right, for instance, this dot here on the right, experiences a big change in the size of this wave. Whereas the dot on the left, it doesn't see anything at all. As far as it's concerned, there are no waves passing by because it doesn't see any rise or fall in the water level, or it, it doesn't see any of the light wave passing by. So there are dead spots and there are hot spots. So if we do this, if we can actually generate standing waves, by sending waves one way and having them come back the other way, we can generate these standing waves. And if we were, for instance, to pass these waves to an object, let's say, for example, we send microwaves, which are just radio frequency light waves, if we send them into food, part of the food will experience a big change in the, in the microwaves that are passing through it. In other words, they will be heated up by the microwaves, and other parts of the food will experience essentially nothing. They'll not be aware of the fact that microwaves are passing through the food. So we will see, if we microwave food, we will see some parts are cooked and some parts are not. And if we look at how far apart the hot spots are, we haven't got a third dot, but you can see that the dot on the right is going up and down, and the same is true of what's going on on the left of that left-hand dot. So can you see that there are two hot spots for every wavelength? Remember the wavelength is from one crest to the next crest, but there are actually two hot spots within that distance. So if we were to measure the distance between two cooked areas of food, then doubling it will give us the wavelength of the wave traveling through that uh, medium. So let's do a demonstration. Let's see if we can get one of these to work. So let's actually try this by putting a piece of chocolate in a microwave. A microwave oven will send microwaves in this case. The microwave generator is on the right-hand side. So that means microwaves whoops, are traveling right. And come back again. Another wave traveling from left to right. 
and hopefully I can generate a standing wave and cook the see where the hot spots are. In case it doesn't work, I did this earlier at home, and I've got a picture of what I did, but let's just see if we can get it to work. The trick is just to know how long to actually wait it for. And I can't remember what I did earlier. I think I did 15 seconds. Let's try it again. Talk amongst yourselves for a minute. And... Ooh, it's starting, it's, yep, it's just starting to go. Now, the question is, how nice is the chocolate? And also the question is, can you see this? So, without changing the lights, uh, it's not showing up particularly well. But there's an area here which has cooked. Can you see under my finger? That area is starting to go. And there's an area over here which is cooked as well. So there were two points on this piece of chocolate and at the moment I can't see any other. So there were two points where the standing wave has definitely produced areas where the wave is going up and down, and the chocolate is responding to that by melting. I'm not going to pass this round. You can have a pictures at it later if you wish. Let me just check how far apart they are. Okay, that's interesting. It's a little bit less than the microwave I had at I tried this experiment. But let me, um, without getting chocolate all over the keyboard, let me show you what it is we're looking at. Okay. What we've done is take an ordinary microwave oven. We remove the turntable because we don't want the chocolate moving whilst we're doing this experiment. Otherwise, it'll keep moving through these hot spots. We put chocolate in there. It will, work with it will also work with cheese. And it's not as clear with cheese. And it's also a waste of cheese, which means it gets the uh, approval from Wallace and Gromit not wasting any cheese. So we cooked it for, in this particular case, about 15 seconds or so. And the distance between the melted regions I'll show you in the next picture when it decides to cooperate. Okay, so there's a piece of chocolate. The, the places that get cooked will not be the same in every microwave. Every microwave slightly different, it generates microwaves in a slightly different way. The wavelengths should be about the same, but depending on the size of the box, and the illustrations are, you place the chocolate because it's a three-dimensional problem and we're just putting a two-dimensional slab in the microwave, you won't always get the same little blob. But in this particular case, when I checked this in my own microwave a while ago, we found, uh, I found two areas which clearly are areas that appear to have started melting, and there's no obvious place where anything else is going on. Those two points are about 6.5. The one that I've just done appears to be a little bit less than that, but it doesn't matter too much. I'm not going for accuracy, I'm going for principle here. So remember, the hot spots are half the, di are half the wavelength, what we saw before with that little animation. There are two hot spots for every wavelength. So if the hot spots, the cooked areas, are 6.5 centimeters apart, that means the wavelength of light, the wavelength of microwaves in this oven, are approximately 13 centimeters, perhaps 12 centimeters for the one I uh, looked at earlier. So the wavelength of microwaves is twice the distance we just measured, so that's 13 centimeters. So we've got a 13 centimeter wavelength, and we're trying to measure the speed of light. So what we need is the frequency, and my of, uh, you can just about see it there, the frequency is uh, 2450. So this one is probably the same. This one is 2450 megahertz as well. That's not a coincidence. That's a particular frequency at which water molecules and that's why microwaves are designed at that frequency because that gives you the maximum penetration heating effect into water. So let's put the numbers in. Speed is by frequency times wavelength. In other words, the size of the wiggle. If we wave traveling along, if we know the wavelength of the wiggle, and we know how many wiggles there are per second, then we know how far this wiggle traveled in one second. So it's literally just the size of the wiggle times the number of wiggles per second. So it's the wavelength times the frequency. The wavelength we've just measured is 13 centimeters. Frequency, read off the back of an oven, because I don't know how else to, to uh, measure that, is uh, 24 50. So 2450 megahertz multiplied by 13 
centimeters gives the speed of light as 320,000 kilometers per second. So we know the actual answer is 300,000 kilometers per second, but it's close enough that even Gromit is impressed with the fact that it's within 10%. Given that chocolate is not the best medium to use, and given that it's sometimes measured to, uh, difficult to measure precisely, and you do tend to get different depending on exactly where you place the chocolate in the microwave oven. But the fact that you can measure the speed of light to 10% in a microwave oven, I still find uh, very interesting. So that's the first demonstration. We have shown that the speed of light is damn fast. Okay. Sometimes I've actually tried this, not with a single piece of chocolate, but if your oven take it, I've tried putting two pieces of chocolate side by side just to get an idea of what the pattern of hot spots looks like. And it's this sort of pattern here. Well, I hesitate to call it a pattern, really. But clearly, we can see a number of different hot spots. They are separated by roughly the same sorts of distances, but not necessarily all the same. So for instance, uh, one of those is uh, seven centimeters, the other is six centimeters, variation. If you can get it within 10%, you're doing OK. And if you are going to try this yourself by buying some chocolate and putting it in your microwave, bear in mind it is possible to zap it for too long. And I suggest you try zapping it for 10 seconds and then have a look at what's happening, then try another five seconds, then another five seconds. Five seconds. What can happen is, uh, sorry, that flashed up too fast. What can happen is you is what can only be described as a mess. It's almost impossible to tell what the whole hell is going on there. Other than there are probably multiple hotspots that have uh, merged together. So just take it easy a few seconds at a time if you want to actually try this for yourself. So that's the first demonstration. Let's return to the guy in the tie talking to the audience of five people. Nice to see more than five of you in the audience here. So let's move on and have a look at other aspects of light. We said earlier that when light combines, or when one wave meets another wave, we can either get reinforcement or cancellation, and we call that interference. So when two waves interfere with each other, it's simply called interference. But if lots of waves are interfering with each other, well, physicists are awkward people. They decide to change the name. It's still interference, but when lots of waves are interfering, it's often called diffraction. So it's not physically anything different. It's just a different name to distinguish two waves interfering versus lots and lots and lots of waves interfering. Let's call that diffraction. And we don't normally notice diffraction effects unless we're really looking for them. We don't normally notice them in everyday life. But astronomers, for instance, might notice diffraction effects. If you've got a very high magnification eyepiece in your telescope and you're looking at a star, for instance, and you might also notice it if you pass light through a narrow slit. So narrow slit, meaning large enough to let light through, but relatively small compared to the wavelength of light, not, for instance, many centimeters, the sort of apertures that you might have in a telescope, centimeters to tens of centimeters to possibly even larger. But if we pass light through a small aperture, then it's possible to see diffraction effects. And the smaller the aperture, the smaller the slit, then the more distinct, the more easily visible those diffraction effects will be. So that's why most of us prefer to have telescopes with large lenses or large mirrors collecting the light. Not only do we collect more light, but the diffraction effects noticeable with larger apertures. So for instance, I tried taking a couple of pieces of cardboard and bringing them very close together to give a very narrow slit and passing light through that slit. It was just light coming, light coming in through the curtains on a sunny day. And you can't really see much of what's going on other than the light comes through the slit. But if you take a picture of that and then enhance the contrast, you see that as well as light coming through the center, perhaps you can see these dark interference fringes on the side. They're a little difficult to see, but they are quite definitely. You can see the fraction fringes, these interference fringes, even just by letting light pass through two closely spaced pieces of card. And if you want to see more of the details, there's a reference down at the bottom there. If you want to follow this up, if you grab the, the handouts, excuse me, if you grab the handouts, then um, you can uh, follow these links and uh, find more information there. If we think of it as a two-dimensional rather than a one-dimensional slit, if we think of light coming in through a two-dimensional aperture, such as a lens or mirror of a telescope, 
we're perhaps used to the idea that a so-called perfect image of a star is not simply an intensity which is very high in the middle and nothing else. Even a perfect star will give you a very high intensity in the middle, but look what's happening around the edge. If you think of the intensity, it's very high in the middle, and then it goes to zero, and then there's another little bump, and then it's zero, and then there's another small bump, then zero. In other words, like ripples in a pond, most of the light is concentrated in the middle bump here, but there will be the star and rings around it. And nothing to do with aberrations in the telescope. That is purely an effect of diffraction. And in principle, we can use these additional rings, not the central blob necessarily, but the existence of these other rings, we can use those because the scale that's on the measurement here, we can judge from the scale what the wavelength is if we know the aperture. So we know that large aperture telescopes will produce very tight star definition. Smaller telescopes will produce larger diffraction effects. But we can reproduce that here, which is what we're going to do in demonstration number two. So let me see if I can get the sequence right. Let's try. What we're going to do is shine a bright light through a narrow slit, and we're going to observe the diffraction effects. And what we're expecting to see is something similar to what we saw for the star a moment ago. What we would expect to get is if we shine a little light through a narrow slit, we wouldn't expect to just get the brightest light in the middle. We're also expecting to see it go dark and then brighter again and then dark and then brighter again and then dark. We're not going to see the faintest of these. So although what we actually want is to know at what point does it disappear, at what point does it go to zero. So in other words, we want these spacings here, which are rather difficult to measure because these things are rather faint. So what we're actually going to do is region. Perhaps you can see that that central region there is twice as wide as the distance from one of these points where it crosses the gray line to the next. So purely for the ease with which we're going to do the measurements, we're going to hopefully observe the fact that we get a bright central peak and then nothing, and then a little fainter one, then nothing, then a fainter one, and we're going to measure the width of that central one. So let me switch to the camera, which is now pointing the wrong way. So let me turn that around to the screen. So this is a black screen simply because lasers firing on white screens tend to produce rather bright and garish results. So, the laser is three meters away from the screen. That's important because I want to know where these fringes are in terms of angle. So I need to know how big it is on the screen and how the screen is from the source over here. So this laser, which is very similar but not quite the same as the laser I'm using to point at the screen, it's a little red laser, it's one milliwatt, uh, no need for health and safety because it's perfectly safe, even if it happened to bounce into the audience. Uh, there's no harm with a laser of this magnitude. So let me see if I can get the laser to pass through this slit. What I have here is a piece of cardboard, or two pieces of cardboard that are placed very close together. Then to the photograph of it next to the ruler, actually works. Turns out this slit is 0.14. And if I shine this red laser through it, you hopefully can see in the bright central region, which is quite wide, and then it goes dark, and then it comes back again, and then it goes dark, and then it comes back again. You might not see the third, um, the third uh, wave, as it were. Uh, it depends on exactly how many other uh, lights are on in the room. But hopefully everybody can see the central bright region, then it disappears, and then there's another sort of pair of wings. Everybody see that okay? So what we want to do is to measure how big that is in whatever, millimeters or centimeters, and then we'll use that together with the distance from the light source to the screen of three meters to work out what we want. So let me, um, at this point, if I'm doing this with schools, I'll ask them, you're all adults, you don't want volunteers, do you? So let me just see what that distance is. A little difficult to see with that ruler. That is approximately three centimeters, give or take a millimeter or so. So it's three centimeters. That central region is three centimeters. 
at a distance of three meters. So that gives us an angle. And that angle will tell us what the wavelength of light is. Let me switch the laser off. Jump back to the PowerPoint. And that is roughly speaking what you saw a moment ago, I hope, yes? A very bright central region which is quite wide. It's actually twice as wide as the distance from one dark po point to the next. And depending on how you're looking at this and if you're lo looking at the recording and you bump the brightness of your monitor up, you might actually notice there's actually a third one out here as well. This dark, which is why we're measuring the width of the central one. So the width of the central one turns out to be about three centimeters. As long as I get that three, meter, three meter throw correct, and I always use the same laser, it come out to be about three centimeters. So that means what we actually want in terms of the distance from one dark point to the next dark point to the next dark point, those will be approximately five centimeters apart because the central bright region is about twice as wide as those distances we're after. So let's have a look at what that looks like in terms of an explanation, a schematic. On the left-hand side, we have a light source that's going through this piece of card with a very narrow slit in it, approximately 0.14 millimeters wide. As I said, I made it, uh, I didn't try and the size, size, I just made it as small as possible and then photographed it to see what I'd actually got. And what we're interested in are these angles here, the angle between one dark point and the next dark point here, which you can see on the screen. And the angle is what we're interested in, for a reason I'll come to in just a second. So that angle is approximately 1.5 centimeters. We measured this bright spot in the middle, but what we're interested in is half of that, which is the 1.5 centimeters from one dark point to the next dark point in this zebra pattern of the diffraction pattern that we produced here. So the angle is given by 1.5 divided by 300 centimeters. Three meters is 300 centimeters. So now we know that angle, and that angle is related to the wavelength of light. So let me just show you that. The separation, strictly the angular separation of the diffraction fringes that we saw, the distance from one dark point to the next, that ratio, 1.5 divided by 300, is the same as the ratio of the wavelength of light to the size of the slit. And so we can say, right, the angular separation we've just measured is 1.5 divided by 300. According to the rules of optics, that should be equal to the used divided by the slit width. I know what the slit width is, I measured it, and the only unknown in this is lambda, the wavelength of light. So if I take that expression and simply multiply both sides by 0.14, I get the wavelength of light is 1.5 over 300 multiplied by the slit width 0.14 millimeters. In other words, I've just demonstrated that the wavelength of red light, because it's a red laser, the wavelength of red light is 700 nanometers. That's just like the speed of light a moment ago, slightly wrong, because this laser is not at the extreme end of the uh, visible spectrum, which runs from 400 to 700. We would expect this laser to have a, a wavelength of approximately, whoops, approximately uh, 650 nanometers. Let's get that annoying arrow out of the way. So we're expecting the result to be about 650 nanometers because the visible light span goes from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. And these red lasers that you uh, typically get will be a little bit in the spectrum. So we've overestimated the, uh, the wavelength of light, again, by about 10%, a similar sort of error to our measurement of the speed of light. But that's, again, not too bad partly because it's rather difficult to measure 0.14 millimeters with any particular Perhaps it should have been 0.13 millimeters, perhaps was the true value. I've just uh, estimated it slightly wrong. So you can see that we've got an estimate for the red light of 700 nanometers. Okay, back to the underlying theory. So diffraction gratings which is what you've got currently in your pocket or lap. Don't take them out just yet, but just that's what we're talking about. A diffraction grating is a piece of plastic or perhaps a piece of glass with parallel spaced lines on it, producing interference. In other words, this is what we uh, would look like on a, on a glass diffraction grating. Light can 
of these rulings and come on, on this and the same on that and the same on that. And all of this light that comes from each of these peaks would interfere. And because there's lots of these, thousands of them in a diffraction grating, we call this a diffraction grating because the light is interfering and lots of light waves are interfering with each other. So depending on the angle at which the light is coming in, you would get certain wavelengths reinforcing and certain wavelengths cancelling, and hence when you look through a diffraction grating, you see the spectrum. At certain angles, you'll see the red light, at certain angles, you'll see the blue light coming from the source, whatever that source might be. So in that sense, diffraction grating behaves a little bit like a prism. But there's one thing to notice. Not only can you get different types of diffraction grating, because they're made of plastic or glass, they can, in principle, be used to reflect light, and so that you see a reflected diffraction uh, effect. Or light can actually pass through, because it's usually engraved onto transparent materials, transparent plastic or glass. So apart from the fact that diffraction gratings can be used in one of two ways, whereas prisms are always light to the glass, the other thing to bear in mind is that the spectrum, the rainbow if you prefer, is generated back to front. In other words, when light passes through a diffraction grating, blue is, uh, is changed in angle by less than red is changed. Whereas when light goes through a prism, as Pink Floyd and Dark Side of the Moon fans will know, the red gets displaced by a small amount and blue gets changed through a larger angle. So they don't quite work in the same way. Both of them spread out the lights into a useful spectrum and... Uh, Newton didn't have access to diffraction gratings in his day. Now we do, and they can be relatively cheaply, even compared to regular chunks of glass, which, of course, are relatively cheap. So that's something to bear in mind. It's not critical for what we're about to see, but it is important in terms of working out the wavelength that blue is a shorter wavelength and gets pushed out, gets diffracted to an angle which is smaller wavelength of red light. So, just like you've already seen interference, because you've seen soap bubbles or you've seen oil in uh, oil spills on the pavement, for instance, you've probably also seen diffraction grating. For instance, a CD, a DVD, in a sense, is a diffraction grating. It's made to be a diffraction grating. It's made to hold data, but the data is spaced by distances which are not so different from the wavelength of light and there's lots of parallel tracks on a CD or a DVD, and hence they behave exactly the same way as a piece of glass or plastic which has been ruled with a lot of lines. You get interference from light combining from each of the tracks, each of the bits of data that are on the DVD or CD. It's actually quite a useful diffraction grating because if you don't actually want to buy a diffraction grating and you've already got an ABBA collection that's not doing anything else, you can actually, you can actually take the DVD and make a spectroscope out of it. You can actually use a uh, serial box, a CD, and a little bit of sellotape and a pair of scissors, and that's pretty much it. You can make yourself a spectroscope in which you can then look at the spectrum of lots of different objects. If anybody wants to try or wants to um, get their son, daughter, grandson, granddaughter to have a go at making a spectroscope, there's the information you need to get your hand out if you want to go back to that at a later date. You've also seen diffraction effects elsewhere in terms of diffraction gratings, because if you look, for instance, at the uh, wings of a butterfly, some insects have pigments that actually give you color, but if you look in detail at what's going on in the wing of a butterfly, you find structures that are comparable in dimensions to the wavelength of light. And so these will diffract light and give you reinforcement of some colors that can so some of the colors that you see in insects are the result of diffraction gratings in, built into the structure of the animal rather than pigments which absorb some colors and not others. So it's about time for demonstration number three. What we're going to do is I'm going to remind you what a spectrum looks like from a prism, but you've, already, you've all seen that before. I'm going to compare that with a spectrum from a diffraction grating, and then we'll look at... Uh, using a diffraction grating from different, uh, different sources. So firstly, I'm going to generate a slit. That's my attempt to have a slit. That's just white light coming through a relatively narrow part of the, uh, of the, of the uh, screen there. And if I simply place a prism in front of the screen, 
what do you get off the left hand side? Everybody has seen these before. You get a rainbow. You've all seen it in the sky after it's rained. The prism light the prism an angle. Angle at It's different. So let's get rid of the prism. Now, which you can, if you wish, take your diffraction grating and hold it up. I suggest you hold it such that, let me just show you. I should, it doesn't matter which way around, but I suggest you keep it horizontal. In other words, um, in landscape rather than portrait. So in other words, the spectrum is going to be sent out sideways. And you hold it um, maybe a centimetre or so in front of your eye. Fairly close. doesn't really matter if you're wearing glasses or not. That might uh, you see the spectrum very clearly on the left. It looks a lot better with the light out. Oh, does that look better? So, on the left-hand side over here somewhere, depending on... Everybody sees something slightly different depending on where you are in the audience. But somewhere close to me, you should see a spectrum. And blue will be on the right and red will be on the left. In other words, blue is closer to the original line and red is further away, the opposite to the spectrum we've just seen. Yep. And you also notice one on the other side as well. Unlike prisms, which produce a uh, by diffraction, because it's based on interference, you will see one on both sides. And in some cases, you can see more than one on both sides. But if you're okay to stay there for the moment and leave the lights off, we'll bring the lights back on in just a moment. But all the colors into different colors. That's what you should have seen earlier, yes? Everybody happy with that? Yep. So. What do you see now? Do you see a big S on the left-hand side? Yeah. So that's my initial for you to look at. So I know there's one on the right-hand side as well, but ignore that because it's a Z rather than an S. So I hope everybody can see. Notice that the red blob, the white produces the same spectrum as before. The red blob produces just a red blob. The blue blob produces just a blue blob. What does the green blob produce when you look at the spectrum? You get, yes, you don't get the green. Over here, depending on exactly where you're looking, the green is actually made up of a lot of green, but actually some red as well. Has everybody got a diffraction grating? Do I need to pass out any more? Okay. Let me grab another one so I can double check what everybody else is seeing. So one thing we notice is that the green, although it looks pure green to our eye, is that in fact it's actually still made of lots of colours. And that's partly just the way that computer screens work. I asked PowerPoint to give me pure red, pure green, and pure blue. But there's no such thing as red, green, and blue. Colours. So I'm guessing that what you should have seen is something that looked a bit like that. Yes? So there's two things to note. What I just pointed out, that green actually has some blue and some red in there, even though blue is mainly blue and red is mainly red. And we only perceive that as green because green is just much brighter than the other colours and we don't see it as white or all colours mixed together. The other thing to notice is um, the distance from the original light source, which is the blobs down the right, and side, the distance the wavelength. We've already established that this over here on the left hand side is approximately 700 nanometers. And if we wish, we can just measure these distances and say, well, if that is about 700 nanometers, which we've already measured, then how much is blue? Well, I think you can just about tell that blue is perhaps a little bit further than halfway in terms of the distance of my hand at one end or the other end spectrum from zero being on the right hand side there, blue is a little bit further than halfway. So if red is 700 nanometers, blue is a little bit more than half of that. So it's a little bit more than 350 nanometers. We know that it should be about. 
So the diffraction grating is confirming where blue stands relative to red in terms of, the, um, in terms of the, its wavelength. And now, I think we'll keep the lights off just for the moment, and I will blank the screen because that's otherwise going to get in the way. I want you to now have a look at a light source, not a projector, where the projector is projecting effectively light-emitting diodes. This is a different light source. This is a fluorescent light. So have a look at what this is. What do you see with that? And feel free to look left and right, and if you get it close to your eye, you can look even beyond the spectrum. What do you see? Another spectrum, a second order spectrum, more interference. Notice that it's not a continuous band of light that you see here. The odd shape you have, the shepherd's crook, if you like, or the candy cane, is just because it's a hairpiece in this particular light. Up a half of it. It gives you a characteristic shape, which makes it easier to see what's going on. But notice that the spectrum it produces doesn't give you all light. You get particular colors coming out brightly, such as, for instance, what's the brightest light in there? Okay. Green should be quite bright, but relatively bright. There's also quite a few blues in there. Some of the light may look a little bit blurred. That's simply because there's lots of particular wavelengths that are occurring fairly close to each other. So let me show you what it is you're looking at, and then you can come back to this in just a second. Whoops, let me take it off blank again. So what we were looking at was a fluorescent lamp, and you should have seen a spectrum on either side. Let's just concentrate on what's on the left-hand side and blow it up. You should have seen a very bright green, quite bright red, and a blue. And a lot of them are so close together, they appear to blur together. That's not that they aren't there. It's just that they are so close together, and relatively faint, that they all blur together almost as one. But perhaps you notice there are actually quite a few different types of red in there. There's a very bright red and a few others there. I will say towards the end of this talk how we can relate these wavelengths to the atoms that are producing these particular colors. And it is basically an atom identification chart. I'm not going to give you a, a complete table of all the elements, but I can tell you that when you actually check what this is, you find that that green actually comes from mercury. There is mercury vapor inside this fluorescent tube, and that's producing a very bright green. And there are coatings on the inside of the tube, and the coating is made up of atoms of europium and atoms of terbium, which is marked. And so we can identify which atoms are actually in that body just by working out this object is a fingerprint of what atoms are producing those light, or those light wavelengths. So having identified them there, you can, if you wish, go back and have another look. And then you can identify, yep, that one is from mercury, that one is from europium, that one is from terbium. These are rare earths if you haven't heard of these elements before. Mercury it produces more than one wavelength of light. It produces the blue and the green. And most of the red is produced by the, um, the rare earths. Why do you mix elements together? Why don't you just leave it as mercury? Well, what light would you see if you... It would not be a good lamp to read by. It would not be a good lamp for illuminating a room or a desk because it would have a color cast to it. The atoms have been added to give you the color balance that produces a nice white result. And again, you can come back and look at that in more detail later if you wish. And I invite you to check them if you're not interested, but if you wish, you can take those diffraction gratings home and look. Thank you if you want to put the lights back on again. If you want to take those diffraction gratings and look at light sources, you will find that all light sources look different. LED light sources look different to fluorescent light sources, which probably look different to your street lights. Your street lights might be sodium, might be mercury, might be... And you can tell what type they are by looking at their spectrum. 
Okay, that's the end of that demonstration. Let's return to the, the general picture. Electromagnetic waves is what we're talking about, and the Scotsman James Clark Maxwell, the best thing to come out of Scotland other than whiskey, it's told, uh, has indicated that in Newton's day, we didn't really know what light was. James Clark Maxwell demonstrated that it is an oscillation of electric and magnetic fields. And again, I'm not going to go into all the details, but that's what uh, it might look like if you try to map out what's happening to the electric field, which is responsible for moving around, and what's happening to the magnetic field, which is responsible for sliding electrical charges. We don't have to worry about the details, but whenever we have an electric field, there is an associated magnetic field, which is why it's called an electromagnetic wave. They're both there. We can't have one without the other. Electric fields generate magnetic fields. Magnetic fields generate electric fields. This is something that uh, Faraday had a lot to say about in, in a previous century, understanding the relationship between electricity and magnetism. And James Clark Maxwell showed that light is a combination of the two. But when it comes to drawing waves, it starts getting very messy if we all draw oscillating one way, let's say horizontally for the sake of argument, and magnetic fields oscillating the other way, let's say vertically. So because these diagrams are getting very messy, what a lot of physicists do, because they're basically just lazy, is to say, well, we know the magnetic field is there. We know it's an electromagnetic wave. So when we're drawing it, we don't really need to draw the magnetic wave because we know it's there. So when we draw a photon of light traveling along, we'll just draw what the electric field is doing. And we won't bother trying to draw the other one, the magnetic field as well. We know it's there, and we know it's perpendicular or orthogonal to the electric wave. So there we have both, but what we tend to do is just think about one. And when I'm going to be talking about polarization, Polarization means is the oscillation of the electric wave of light traveling, let's say, from your left to your right, is it oscillating up a bit, oscillating side to side, or vice angle? So knowing that the magnetic field doesn't matter, we're going to define polarization as what is the electric field doing and how with anything else. So that is what we would call linear polarization. Linear either oscillates up, down, or left, right when traveling through vacuum. It might do something different if it traveled through glass or through water or some other medium, but if it's traveling through a vacuum, let's say light from the sun traveling towards the earth, if it starts oscillating in one particular direction, it will spend the next 93 million miles continuing to oscillate in that particular direction. But it is possible to generate different types of light, not light that's just oscillating up and down or backwards and forwards. It is possible to generate in ways that I'm not going to describe by passing light through various types of uh, glass. It is possible to generate light, which is a sort of a corkscrew. It's called circular polarized light or circular polarization. And it looks really weird because instead of having the light simply pointing its electric field up, down, backwards and forwards, up, down, up, down, up, down. It seems to be spinning in one direction. It's a sort of corkscrew, if you like. And just like polarization in the linear sense can be either vertical or horizontal, so polarization in the circular sense can either be corkscrewing clockwise or corkscrewing anti-clockwise. So we don't need to worry too much about the subtleties, but it's interesting to know that it is possible for us to make circular polarized light but other parts of the animal kingdom have actually beaten us to it. Let's have a look at some demonstrations. Let's pass light through some polarizing filters, and a polarizing filter is a filter that will only let through light, for instance, that's oscillating up and down, or a different type of polarizer will only let through light that is oscillating side to side. That's what we mean by a polarizing filter. And then I'm going to show you and invite you to come and have a look later of what happens when we pass light through a calcite crystal and then through uh, 3D glasses. For those of you who have 3D TVs, the glasses that come with 3D TV, the cheap ones, are circular polarized. In other words, light passing through one eye lens is polarized to produce light corkscrewing one way, and light coming through the other lens is corkscrewing the other way. 
So when the TV is being sent a 3D signal, each of your eyes picks up a different part of the image to give you a three-dimensional impression. 3D TVs don't seem to be as popular as they used to be, for reasons I don't quite understand, but there we go. So in this particular demonstration, what we're going to do is to place two polarizing filters effectively back to back. One will only let through light that, po that is oscillating left and right. The other one will only let through light that is polarized that way, which means light can't get through two of them together because it's either doing one or the other. It can't do both at the same time. So when you've got this so-called cross no light should come through. So then we're going to say, right, okay, what happens if we now place a sheet of plastic in between those two polarizers? In other words, we're going to take a sheet of plastic which has got some sticky tape on it. The sticky tape is essentially transparent. There's nothing much going on there. But we place that in between two polarizers and say, what would we expect to see? If the polarizers are placed such that no light gets through, what difference can it possibly make if we put a piece of plastic in between them? So let's switch to the webcam and find out. So let me put the light on. And again, I invite you to come and play with this yourself in a little while. This is two sheets of polarizer, which um, if the blue tack holds, each of them is, would let through a lot of light. That's what one polarizer would do. It still lets through most of the light. But if we have two polarizers, a lot of the light is killed. It's not perfectly dead, but most of the light is now eliminated because one is polarized one way, one is polarized the other way. What if I take a piece of plastic, which is perfectly colorless, you might notice, perfectly colorless piece of sellotape, what if I place it in between the two polarizers? Can you see generate a whole load of plastic? And this particular piece of plastic has got sellotape all over it. Some sellotape is one tape thick, some sellotape is two tapes thick, some sellotape is three tapes thick. And you notice that the colors depend on the thickness sellotape. You get these weird effects if I uh, bend it with respect to the camera as well. So this is easier to see live than it is to see on a webcam because webcam is not particularly good at picking up the colors. But I hope you can see that without the sellotape there we get boring essentially nothing but with and if the sellotape you get nothing that's just completely colorless but if the sellotape goes between polarized What's actually happening there, let me just switch that off, is the uh, one polarizer, let me jump back, one polarizer is looking through light of a particular orientation, let's say it's horizontal, and the sellotape is, the tape is actually changing the polarization. I said before, the polarization doesn't change through a vacuum, but it's through a medium such as water, air or glass or plastic, it is possible for the polarization to change. How does it change? Well, it changes according to the wavelength of light. So some wavelength of light will change the polarization to allow that light to go through the second polarizer. Other wavelengths won't be changed by enough to go through the second polarizer. So some light gets reinforced, some light gets cancelled, hence we get the colors there. Why should we care about the fact that plastic in between polarizers actually shows pretty colors. Well, this is the principle of polarizing microscopes used extensively by geologists. If you take a piece of rock and, and section it really thin, you see nothing interesting in a piece of rock. Put it in between two polarizers, that rock, just like this bit of plastic, will change the polarization and will allow you to study what is the nature of that rock. Is it calcite? Is it quartz? Is it feldspar? Is it this? Is it that? You can tell what you're looking at because of the way that rock sample changes the polarization of light. So it is a very useful tool for uh, geologists to actually study the nature of rocks. That's a somewhat better picture. That's uh, me taking a picture with a camera rather than a webcam. So you can see the colors a little more clearly. That's what the sellotape looks like if you were to just look through it. And this is the same, but now we have a polarizer in front and behind, in other words, between the cross polarizers, and you 
can see that um, we get different colors, and the color changes abruptly when we get a step in the thickness of the sellotape. So you can see some pieces of sellotape are sticking out there, nothing interesting going on apart from a few air bubbles in it, but the colors come out quite vividly when you look at it through the cross polarizers. So again, come and have a play with that later. Uh, another thing which I'd like to come and have a look at here is a calcite crystal. Again, what happens when light passes through a calcite crystal? That's quite interesting, and I'll show you, rather than talk about it here, I'll show you in just a second, but the uh, spoiler alert is what it can do is produce two images of everything that's uh, behind it. So if the object behind it is a series of crosses, those crosses get doubled up. In other words, light different paths through the crystal to get from the source of light to your eye. And that's uh, one of the interesting properties of uh, crystals like this because of the way atoms are arranged inside the crystal itself. But time is getting on, and I still want to cover a few slides, if you'll bear with me just for a few more minutes. Uh, another interesting property of polarization is, uh, is here. This is a picture of my office a few years ago where I've got some zebras on the computer monitor there. And reflected in the window is the computer monitor, but no zebras. Zebras don't have reflections. I don't know if you knew that. So obviously, zebras are vampires. This is pretty obvious. Uh, and again, I'm a vampire here. And I invite you to come and look at the property of disappearing reflections from vampires. Did you know that some beetles are left-handed? Uh, I'm not talking about Paul McCartney. I'm talking about Beatles people. And here, again, I invite you to come and have a look in just a moment. If you look at some beetles through glasses that only let through light that's screwing one way, you see the left-hand image, beautiful colors from the beetle. But if you look at that same beetle with right circular polarized light, no colors whatsoever. A little bit of shininess because the carapace of the beetle is actually reflective. But notice how the colors are entirely left circular polarized. The light beetle is entirely corkscrewing one way. It's not corkscrewing one way and then the other way. It's not polarized one or the other. Every beetle in this species is left polarized. And if you look at those same beetles right polarized, you see no colors whatsoever. I have not yet found any beetles that are right polarized, but I've got a selection of them here for you to look at. Okay, I just want to finish with this idea of where the light comes from. Light is generated whenever we have electric charges that are moving. To generate an electromagnetic wave, we need to move electric charges around. And we can do that in a particle accelerator. We can send electrons around a particle accelerator, or we can send protons around a particle accelerator, and that will generate light because we're accelerating them. But of course, atoms have a whole load of moving electrons, so atoms will generate light. And we can think about atoms as being a positively charged nucleus and negatively charged electrons buzzing around them. But that doesn't give us the proper picture of the fact that different electrons have different energy levels. And it would be better to think that's not entirely accurate because an atom isn't really a solar system. But at least this picture shows us that electrons have different distances to the nucleus. And it's plausible that those electrons have different energies with respect to the nucleus. So we shouldn't think of it as a pancake. We should think about them in shells, three-dimensional shells. But that top picture is good enough to remind us that different electrons have different energies. And if different electrons have different energies, then our knowledge of how the quantum world works when we look at molecules, we realize that on the scale of the very small, we realize that photons of light with a given energy have a particular wavelength, or if you like, a particular color. So we're used to the idea that this is a color scale as well as a wavelength scale, but to a physicist, it's also an energy scale because red light has lower energy than blue light. If you can see, it goes the opposite way. But it doesn't matter the fact that it goes the opposite way. What matters is, for any particular energy of light, there's a corresponding wavelength and a corresponding color. So if an atom has a particular arrangement of electrons, that means an atom will have a particular arrangement of energy levels, and hence a particular arrangement of light will be emitted or absorbed by that atom. That's how we identified what atoms were present in the fluorescent light we showed earlier. Every atom is unique. 
in terms of its atomic arrangement, in terms of its electronic arrangement in the atom. And therefore, every atom has a particular set of energy levels and hence a particular set of colors that it will emit or absorb. And that allows us to see what is going on in terms of a fluorescent And it allows us to cut fireworks. If we put salt into a firework, the firework looks yellow. If we put into a firework, we get blue fireworks. If we put strontium in, we get colors correspond to the atoms because each ha atom has a fingerprint. And I tried with uh, a diffraction grating, just asking myself, I wonder what would happen if you put a diffraction grating, uh, for instance, in a telescope. Um, and again, if you look at the details, there's uh, details in one of the PDFs here. This is what happens when you look at a, a little star field around the ring nebula. Seven, the stars end up being spread into a continuous spectrum, red, green, and blue. It looks a little bit blobby, but that's just part of the process. But notice that the ring nebula doesn't get spread out and blurred into one long oval. You get nothing, 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 and a distinct ring corresponding to oxygen. And then nothing, 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 and then a distinct ring corresponding to hydrogen. And if you look close, there's actually a nitrogen ring in there as well. So in other Planetary nebula, like the ring nebula, actually emit at very specific wavelengths that correspond to very specific atoms. And so we can tell what the ring nebula is made of simply by spreading it out into its spectrum, as we saw before with a diffraction grating. That's why people put spectroscopes on the end of telescopes. Okay, that's a very old one, but it's the same basic idea. If you wish, you can buy yourself a grating that screws into the back of an eyepiece so that you can look at the spectra of stars, for instance. I decided that it's worth a try. I put a diffraction grating into the front of a camera, not a telescope, just a camera with a lens and a diffraction grating in front of the dust cap with a hole in it. And, took Betelgeuse. and there's the spectrum of Betelgeuse that I got from my back garden by putting a diffraction grating in front of the camera. And by measuring the intensity of light, you see that it gets a full spectrum, but also we get these dark absorption bands coming in corresponds to these little dips here, and by looking at where they occur in wavelengths, we can identify what atom or what compound is producing those. So by putting a diffraction grating in front of a camera and going into your back garden, you can tell that Betelgeuse has got helium and titanium oxide and iron and vanadium oxide and sodium in its atmosphere. You can tell what it's made of just with a diffraction grating like the one you're holding and putting it up to a camera and taking a short exposure. We know that telescopes have come a long way in the last few hundred years. Of course, everybody wants large telescopes, partly because they collect more light and so produce brighter images. But one of the reasons is that you get less reflection and hence you get sharper images. You get higher resolution. But one of the most important things that you must remember is that regardless of whether it's the Space Telescope or the James Webb Telescope or the European Extremely Large Telescope, which is coming on fairly shortly, without spectra, we would not be able to see what these, uh, these objects are made of. Hubble can produce some wonderful images which shows you what it looks like, but if you want to know what it's doing, what's it made of, how is it moving, what's the dynamics, if you want to know anything else other than what it looks like, you don't need a camera, you need a spectroscope. And for instance, in the case of the European Extremely Large Telescope, it's something like, I can't remember what the ratio is, it's something like three cameras are uh, planned, but seven spectrographs are planned. That gives you an indication that spectra are considered by scientists to be far more valuable than images. Images are great, but spectra are really valuable because you can tell what atoms are there and what they're doing. So Auguste Comte, uh, over 100 years ago, made this comment, we will never know the composition of the stars. But I hope I've convinced you that with a diffraction grating, Absolutely, we can tell what the stars are made of. If you can tell what that lamp is made of without getting within 10 meters of it, you can certainly tell what Betelgeuse is made of without getting within 600 light years of it. So, I hope you now have a better understanding of what light is. You've seen demonstrations that have shown that the speed of light is somewhere in the vicinity of 300,000 kilometers a second. You've seen a demonstration that red light has a wavelength of about 700 nanometers. And thanks to a diffraction grating, you've seen that blue light is 
so about 400 nanometers. You can see that this in color is using prism or using a diffraction grating, and I've shown you that light waves can be polarized in different ways. The line is, I would like you to spend a little while over a cup of tea or coffee playing with these demonstrations that I've got at the front. And if you wish, please take the diffraction grating home with you and go and explore with yourself and any other members of your old the various light sources that you have tucked around your home. Thank you all for listening.